early March, um, obviously the news was um, rife with discussions around what was happening in Wuhan and then in Italy. Um, and the pictures obviously from Italy uh, were really um, tragic and um, frightening. I think it was late February, early March that we started having really um, clear discussions and information from public health that was giving us um, a best reasonable case and a worst reasonable case projections about what this could mean for Doncaster and Bassett Law in terms of numbers of excess deaths per day and those that data was really really scary actually and I remember having a conversation with senior managers and senior doctors across the organisation and there was an element of disbelief about what that data was telling us. Preparation started in earnest um, and obviously we were guided by Public Health England uh, and the NHS um, e and I in terms of what we needed to do. So from that perspective, a number of people met and set up um, the incident rooms, uh, both in Doncaster and Bassett Law. We made the decision that we would have um, the silver triumvirate that was um, a senior doctor, a senior manager and a senior nurse working together to coordinate that kind of senior operational uh, management of the site um, as we moved into this pandemic phase. And that was seven days a week, eight till eight. Um, and that, you know, our senior leaders stepped up fantastically well to support what was a really onerous rotor um, and, you know, we had in place for months and months. We started having really um, detailed, um, very rapid planning meetings with each of the divisions to work out what their plans would be for their services, for their people, for their patients and also some of the um, external conversations as well um, about and trust-wide conversations about what we might do for different services. So that included um, kind of just generally the number of patients who were being um, treated or admitted through the emergency departments, um, equipment both in terms of uh, uh, PPE and then obviously things like um, infusion pumps, ventilators. And then looked at patient flow and beds in terms of where we needed to split the hospital up um, what pathways we would use and so working really closely with uh, kind of the key clinical staff um, and the director of infection prevention and control looking at pathways for patients um, and as an organization we looked at blue uh, for non-covid pathways and yellow for covid pathways we were requesting plans from each of the divisional leadership teams you know within a couple of days this was the pace we were working at and they were describing their redeployment plans about how they would move our colleagues and teams to the areas that were going to be most hard hit how they were going to um, step down the routine elective services but maintain uh, services for those patients that were most urgent how they were going to make sure that they kept patients safe during this time that wouldn't be coming to their usual outpatient appointments so it was a real real rapid rapid period of change in decision making um, and and you know it felt really overnight within about 48 hours for example we moved um, around 50 to 60 percent of all um, outpatient consultations to telephone which you know just rapid rapid change achieved in just a couple of days and all the way along communicated really effectively with teams um, so the comms department worked fantastically well with us to ensure that any updated information was shared with the wider organization um, so everybody was aware of what needed to be done We also had to make really big decisions about where services were based and how we organised the estates. There's lots of walks around all the different sites to look at actually how we, what we closed down, so which doors we locked um, and which we kept open to minimise um, flow of people coming in and out of the organisation. So for example dermatology services we moved them to Montague to provide a really protected environment. We moved our um, urgent cancer patients to Park Hill. Um, to ensure that they had a protected environment where they could uh, gain direct access to the outpatient facility without coming through the rest of the hospital to keep their infection risk down. We moved our respiratory unit down the tower block to, because we knew that there would be improved oxygen supply. Um, and we also started to have to very rapidly planning for really extended critical care 
um, capacity. So there were such big decisions being made very quickly. We made as an exec team, we made a big decision early on to invest in additional mortuary capacity. Um, again, fantastic work from the pathology team and the estates team to be able to deliver that change in capacity that we had very, very quickly. And unfortunately, that we, we didn't have to use that to, to the extent we feared we might have to. So there was really significant partnership working taking place. So um, at a strategic level, um, through the ICS, there will be regular meetings of Q's chief executives, other senior execs. But also at a place level in Doncaster and Bassett Law, we were working with all partner organisations to plan for the further surge capacity we might need across across the organisation. So big discussions with Ardash about how they could support us differently to pull patients out of the hospital as quickly as possible, whether COVID or not. We were in lots of discussions with social care about how we changed the pathways to care homes. Um, and, and also, of course, with primary care in terms of how we um, supported them to set up hot COVID primary care clinics, which they used our Retford Hospital for in, as one location. And, and also, of course, the, the impact on elective patients and how we worked with GPs to reassure them that we were keeping these patients safe who unfortunately had to have their outpatient consults um, or operations, routine operations delayed. <laughs> We got the plans together, we went through the first wave. The peak wasn't as bad as it could have been, so we were hugely relieved by that and we did manage, we did have capacity um, and our teams did an amazing job. I think then as we came out of that um, peak, actually the challenge of restoring elective services then was actually really difficult because we had to do that in a completely different way to how we usually manage services so the additional social distancing requirements still trying to maintain um, obviously remote consultations because it was much safer to do that um, and also m we were still dealing at this point with really high levels of staff absence you know 10 15 percent at times so so that was delivering our services um, was was still really, really challenging and, and also an appreciation of the level of backlog that we were dealing with. And whilst we had really good systems in place for managing clinical risk and making sure the most urgent patients were seen, there was still a concern about these growing backlogs and whether there may be risk we don't know about or patients whose uh, diagnosis wasn't fully clear yet. And then, of course, we came out of the summer um, into September, October. Um, and at that point, we're starting to see the national numbers go up again. Um, on COVID, we were informed from public health that we had six weeks until we reached our peak. The peak was with us within 10 days. So I think as an organisation and as a region, we had a second wave much earlier than other places. Um, so the second wave was much more difficult because there wasn't the national mandates in terms of stopping all elective care. So more operating, more outpatients that we were managing alongside this big um, COVID peak. So a real, um, that was a really, really challenging time. And then we'd start to visit it again um, and then we had to stop visiting again. But we were then expected to do outpatient work, um, elective surgery. So putting those pathways in place again to make sure that staff felt safe, but patients felt safe when they came to the organisation and managing very different expectations in terms of the two metre social distancing, having to wear a mask. And so we had to be really, really quite prescriptive in terms of if you can't wear a mask um, and you haven't got a kind of reason to not have one, then you can't come in. So actually the staff had to deal with a very different approach to public expectations compared to the first lockdown. And then, of course, we were learning that we were expecting a third wave in January. Um, and I think there was real concern, actually, amongst um, the senior leadership team at that point that this would build on uh, a very high level of patients we still had in the hospital. We, we got to January, we had this very high level of um, patients still in hospital at that time, probably about 150 from the peak of about 230. Um, and very, very fortunately for us, South Yorkshire and Bassel, that by that point, we were in lockdown again. Um, from must have been mid October, and hopefully, and I, we think that suppressed the further peak we could have seen, which I think would have been really, really challenging to deal with. So we came out of January, I think, with a slight element of relief, but that that with, but also the, the huge level of challenge that the teams were dealing with at that point, you know, cannot be underestimated, and the level of fatigue and exhaustion really of teams right across the organisation that have been dealing with this pandemic for now 
you know, nine or ten months was just can't be underestimated. And then gradually, as we started seeing the numbers falling, the vaccine program really kicking in, um, and we started to see really linked data that showed the impact of the vaccine program, uh, which meant that um, we saw we're seeing you know more lots more patients discharged and far fewer patients coming in with COVID, which was just you know f- absolutely fantastic to see. And at that point. Um, we really started being able to step up our elective um, surgery, our elective outpatients. We obviously have to now deal with a backlog of patients who weren't treated um, and ensure that we treat them people in order, but actually that we absolutely offer as much activity as we can um, for our patients within the region. The flip side to that is ensuring that our staff are rested So they've been through a period of unprecedented challenge for the NHS um, and we have to look after them as well. And that's really important to balance off um, the needs of our staff against the needs of the patients. What went well was how staff reacted So obviously a lot of areas were closed down. A lot of people um, had to shield and staff were moved uh, to key areas, uh, especially through respiratory, through intensive care. Never have I been more proud to work for the NHS than during this period. I think the the agility and innovation of teams was just magnificent, absolutely fantastic. And it was just, amazing to see the level of change that could be achieved both within the organisation and working with partners across the system. Obviously um, there's been a lot of focus on um, uh, the emergency department, respiratory um, and intensive care but our elective surgical wards and our surgical staff um, when their wards were shut down in the original um, lockdown all moved to other areas and actually Wards that were having specialised areas, we had a urology ward, we had an ENT ward, um, we had a vascular ward, those wards still haven't gone back to normal. So the flexibility of the staff is probably the thing that where I'm most proud of. And I think, I think the other thing I would reflect on is the challenge of leadership, I think, in that context. So both seeing the best of leadership and, and sometimes the, 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 the challenge of leadership under pressure and how we all responded as teams and leaders in the organisation to that. I think I learned a huge amount about my own leadership style and also, you know, I think we all did, a, you know, across the organisation. That gave a lot of food for thought um, and um, a lot of fantastic reflection, I think, and a real, but a real, real um, accolade to Team DBTH in terms of how they stepped up. So I'd like to give my heartfelt thanks to the staff at DBTH for all the work they've done over the last 18 months. Staff have worked tirelessly throughout this pandemic to ensure that patients do receive the care that they're entitled to and their dedication, their flexibility has been tried and tested beyond what any of us could have imagined. So it is absolutely fundamental and important to us as an organisation that we look after those staff and that over time we try and get back to as normal um, an operating model as we can. Thank you.